There is no way I can tell you how happy I am that we're back here. Uh, it's been a year, and I'm happy to be with you. I know that for some of you, this has been one of the hardest years of your life. That's the truth, isn't it? And for some of you, it's just been a year of great joy. And sometimes when we all get in a room together, we kind of want to share our joy. We kind of want to share our heartaches. We're just not sure who to share it with or how much to share. So what I would hope would happen over the next few days is that we'd risk a little bit and share a little bit and not be too worried about whether or not someone will receive my joy, or listen to my heartache. I hope we'll get past that. So you know how sometimes we're coming in and kind of sitting down and getting ourselves settled in, and then when we get up to go and we're kind of walking out, and there's all kinds of questions like what? Where are you going to go next? Where are you going to go to dinner? Who's picking us up? Right? We got all those questions. Well, there are other questions you can ask. Like one of the questions could be, what's it been like for you over the last few months? And when someone says, ah, you know, there's been a tough season. Instead of saying, well, I'll pray for you, which is good. Say something like, hey, tell me more. And look for a comfortable place to sit. You said, well, I'd have to plan for that. Well, you planned for dinner. <laughs> so maybe plan for the conversation. That's what I hope will happen over the next few days. Okay. Um, what I'd like for us to do is to uh, settle into what we're going to do. The three-day class is the tale of the dove, okay? And you kind of get the idea of uh, uh, what we'll be talking about, the Holy Spirit. But here's what we'll be looking at. The premise is that the struggle that I've had in preparing this is this. Religion has never been more irrelevant in our society. All the statistics, and I know you look at this stuff, so all the statistics will tell you, never been more irrelevant. The problem is the church has never been more needed. So you're kind of in a jam, you know? People think they don't want the church, and the very thing they need is the church. When Susan and I were young in ministry, really young in ministry. We were living out in the middle of Arkansas and the closest neighbor is about eighth of a mile down the road. And this guy got cancer. Elsie uh, Cooper was his name. And he got cancer on his nose. But we didn't know it. We didn't know it. He started wearing a bandage to church. And, but he was wearing it a long time, like weeks. So of course, that's not a normal wound, right? So I went down there one day to mow his lawn and uh, I knocked on the door and everybody's doors there were open. So I walked in and he didn't see me coming and I saw his nose in a reflection of a mirror. And there was a hole all the way through. I knew this was trouble. I called his daughter. I said, look, if we have to hog time, we've got to take him to the hospital. Well, the very thing he needed is the very thing he feared. Right. And if we hadn't got, you know, if the Lord hadn't revealed that, then we'd have lost him. Right. And sometimes we're losing opportunities in the world because we recognize that people aren't too thrilled about the church. And so then we kind of come in with a little sheepish, at, oh, I'm not really at the church, you know, because I know you don't like it. Rather than coming in and saying, you know, I know you don't like it. And that's the part of the church I don't like either. But I found something really special in my relationship with God. And I live it out. And I would love to be able to have dinner and learn from you and you learn from me. And somehow we kind of cross-pollinate and help bring these two factions together in our country. How many of you know someone who used to go to your church and they don't go anymore and they don't have a good feeling about it? Right? But how many of you know the story is kind of complicated? Like there's just not one thing. Well, that's what's going on with all of us. My dad used to say, humans are simply complicated. Right? What we do, not too hard to figure out. Why we do it, be a little more difficult. So that's what we're going to work on. Here's the three steps we're going to take, one today and uh, one tomorrow and then one the next day. Uninformed, what we were never told about the Spirit. Uniformed, the truth we were supposed to believe, whether it was right or not. And then finally, pneumiformed, 
breathing spirit life into the body of Christ. So if you want to know what we're going to be doing, why don't you take out your phone and just take a quick picture of the screen, and then you can kind of follow up on that. Because what I would ask you to do is pray about it, right? And process it. Like if you already know that tomorrow we're going to be talking about kind of this uniform way that we were supposed to think about the spirit, I know you'll start reflecting on things that have happened over the course of your life where you might have thought something and somebody else told you not to think that. So you quit talking about it, but you still thought it. Right? I was on a mission trip and I was in Clarion, Pennsylvania. And I'd been a Christian about, I don't know, seven or eight months. So, you know, you have two or three verses and that's all anyone needs to know. And I'm going door to door, knocking on people's door. This woman comes to the door, invites me in. She tells me she has a demon in her washing machine. True story. <laughs> demon, it's a true story. Demon in her washing machine. Well, I grew up in kind of a mechanical household. My thought was, oh, no, baby, you just got all the towels on the one side. You got to spread them out a little bit. That demon will come out of that washing machine. Why in the world would she think there was a demon? Well, that's only one question. Why in the world would I, out of hand, dismiss it? Because those of you that have traveled to some other countries around the world, especially in the global south, you've seen the same thing. And it's not washing machines. It's life. Demons are ruining our tribe, our community, our life, our family. And we're sitting there thinking, no, it's not demons. You guys just need some marital counseling. So why do they think it's spiritual and we don't? So it does matter that we process what we're going to be working on. So let's get started. Uh, we're going to work on this today, what we are never told about the Spirit. So what I want you to do is we're going to look at some texts today, and especially two. And I want these two texts, we're going to focus on John chapter 1, and then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And what we intend is not that you would see these in a linear fashion, but think of them like braided. We're going to braid these two texts together about what we were not told about the Spirit. So the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, this is the one I meant when I said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. If I could get someone eight feet tall to come up here with a marker pen, a highlighter, I would want you to highlight that phrase. I didn't know him. Now, what's unusual about that phrase? Go ahead and call it out. What's unusual about the phrase? They're related. Right? How big is Israel? How many of you have been to Israel? Yeah. You know, I did the map on this. It's an eighth the size of Georgia. How many of you have lived in a place that's small enough that you just kind of stumble over people? My mom lives in a tiny farming community out in Gateway, Colorado. My dad used to say, hey, everyone you know is a relative. If you throw a rock, you hit a relative and you might have wanted to, right? So there, everyone knows each other, right? So he can't mean, I did not know Yeshua Bar Joseph, or Bar Joseph. I, I can't, I don't mean I didn't know that. It's not like I didn't know his mom. It's like I didn't know I didn't know my cousins. I mean, they had a big old family. I didn't know my cousins. So what is he saying? Well, back up. What's his confession in verse 29? He's the Lamb of God. So in verse 30, what's John saying? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. But I do now. So how did it happen? Well, you see, here's what happened. I learned that the reason I came baptizing with water was so that he might be revealed. So if we could get our eight-footer back up here, I'd want that eight-footer to circle the word revealed. Because there was something right in front of us that we weren't seeing and it had to be revealed, and God used me as a part of the revealing. Well, then John gave this testimony. Here's what happened. I saw something. What did you see, John? I saw the Spirit. Well, you can't see a Spirit. No, I did. No, you didn't. 
I did too. You did not. I did. Well, how'd it come? Well, it came down from heaven. Okay, well, that's his address, so we know he'd come from there. He came from heaven as a, as a dove. Somebody else is standing there back there. I've seen a lot of doves. They want the spirit of God. I was out there working in a field. Dove flew over me, did something that should not not be done. I'm sure the spirit would not have done that. Right? So I've seen lots of doves, and they weren't the spirit. Well, John says, let me, let me tell you what happened. I myself didn't know him. I thought you already said that. I know, but I need to reiterate because here's what happened. The one who sent me to baptize had a conversation with me. Here's what he told me. The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify. That this is the Son of God. So what's he say twice? I didn't know this about him. Well, how'd you end up knowing it? Well, the one who told me why I was here said, I'm going to help you get to know the one that you're waiting for. I want to clarify that this is the Lamb of God who came into the world. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul picks up on this. Now, remember, we're not thinking linear. We're braiding these together. Paul says, after he told them, when we came among you, we didn't come with eloquent words. We came with a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. But you see, it's not the wisdom of this age or the, of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No. We declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden, and that God destined for our glory before time began. You see, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So you notice, John says, let me tell you what happened. I knew who he was. How did you know that, John? Well, because I wouldn't have known it just by looking. You know, like using human eyes, human ears, human touch, human signs, human recognition. I'd have never got past the fact that he had carpenter's dust on him. He smelled like a carpenter shop. You get what I'm saying? Well, John, what happened? He said, well, wisdom from above came and revealed something I would have never known. What does Paul say? Well, you see, the people that stayed stuck in earthly wisdom, they stayed there long enough to kill him. So those that stayed in worldly wisdom thought Jesus should be killed. Those that received godly wisdom thought he was the author of life. What's the difference? Well, Paul says the same thing John said. Depends on which wisdom you're listening to. So the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. Now, the person without the Spirit doesn't accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, how many of you are following along in your own Bible? What verse did we leave out? Thank you. Would someone stand and read verse 9? Uh, anyone? Okay. What no eye has seen. Say it, everyone together. What no eye has seen. What no ear has heard. What no ear has heard. 
and what no human mind has conceived. The things God has prepared for those who love him. What? <laughs> Could you do that again? The whole thing. What no eye has seen. Oh, stop, stop, stop. So look at your neighbor and say, not you either. Okay, go ahead. What no ear has heard. Not you either. Not you either. Go ahead. And what no human mind has conceived. Certainly not you either. <laughs> See, some of you are sitting with your spouse. Oh, I know it was not them. They can't remember. <laughs> can't remember put, put their underwear in a hamper, right? You know, right? But what did God do? The things God has prepared for those who love him. So God prepared it. And God, thank you, revealed it. So here's what I want you to understand. Did Jesus have a good opinion of, the, of John the Baptist? Yes. A very high opinion, right? You kind of remember this a little bit? Yeah. Remember, he said, there's never been anyone like him. No prophet like him. I, I mean, you go back all the way to the beginning. No one like John. So tell me your name again. Matt. Matt. No one like John. But did John's eyes see it? Did his ears hear it? Did his mind conceive it? And there was no one like him. So for someone like John, not even John would have got it. Were it not for the Spirit. Hmm. So now I'm starting to wonder. How much have our eyes seen, our ears heard, and our minds conceived that we actually think is of God that isn't? Because it's only revealed through the Spirit. It's only discerned through the Spirit. Right? Right? After my dad passed away in 2014, we had two funerals, one in Atlanta and one in Colorado. We went to the one in Colorado, and that's where he had been a member of a wonderful church there in Colorado. And so a lot of the guys that he had served with were kind of coming through the funeral line and sharing stories about my dad. And one guy came up and he said, you know what made your dad stand out? And I said, I would really love to know. He said, well, he thought Jesus was right about everything. <laughs> I, I, I think you're right. I think you're right about that. But a second guy said something that just blew my mind. This was an elder. He said, we were having a men's business meeting. You do realize that Dante wrote about men's business meetings. <laughs> Some of you are like, yes, the seventh level of hell, right? But he said, we're having a men's business meeting. It had gone on for like two and a half hours, right? Oh, everyone waxing long. He said, your dad sat back there and listened for the longest time. And then finally he raised his hand. He said, so I called on him. And he said, your dad asked a question that changed our church. Really? What was the question? He said, your dad asked, what does any of this have to do with God? Well, what would be the defensive answer? Well, everything has to do with God. This is a church. We're in eldership. Of course it has to do with God. But that's not what he was asking. What he was asking was, why have you benched God and put in the starting five and you're playing the whole game without your best player? The one that actually knows why we're on the court. You see, the struggle that John reveals and the struggle that Paul reveals is that we honestly have such an astounding appreciation for our own human logic, reasoning, degrees, smarts, just down-home good sense. We've got such a high imagination of ourselves that it just seems that if we need the Spirit, we'll shoot him an email. But I mean, beyond that, you know, we're, we'll kind of work it out in a, in a meeting. Well, that's one way to do it. But it doesn't work very well. I was a little older in ministry. We'd moved from Arkansas to Ohio. 
So we're in Ohio, and I meet these two guys. One of them had been a member of the church for a long time at Wayward, and uh, I met him, and over time he came back, and he had a best buddy that had never been uh, a Christian, and we met him at a construction site, and eventually he became a Christian, and then we, we developed this uh, small group of guys that would get together to help disciple each other, grow together in the Lord, you know, and I don't know, there's probably about a dozen of them, and one night, uh, 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 they, they, two of them showed up, those two guys, and no one else came. I thought that was strange until they told me, well, we told them not to come because there's something we want to confront you about. Huh. Well, come in. I say to Susan in the kitchen, hold the refreshments till we see others. <laughs> right? I might eat that whole key lime pie by myself. Right? So they come in, sit down. We could be a whole lot better friends if you would let us. Hmm. So I thought back to all the times that I had mistreated them, and I wondered if I would tell them why I did it. And that night I decided I would. I said, well, the problem is, is that I'm jealous. I'm jealous of you. That's the problem. And that's why I pout. Now, see, I was 26, telling two other 26-year-olds that I pout. Who does that? No one. No, that's what your mom says, quit your pouting. But you don't ever say, oh, no, 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 I'm pouting. <laughs> but you see, what was happening was the Spirit was saying, I know what human wisdom would tell you to do. Kind of be defensive, you know, create some illusion so that you can act like you got it together when you know you don't. You know, try to develop mutuality and reciprocity and a sense of equality based on a lie. Anyone else in here? danced around that word jealousy because you kind of felt like if you admitted it, it was like you were back in middle school. Or how would someone take it? And the Spirit is saying, go ahead. Just name it. But if I name it, who am I? And what am I? And he said, well, what you might become is a revealer. Someone who reveals the wisdom of God. Hmm, I don't know about that. So the Spirit says, well, I did leave you a book, so let's, let's make use of it. <laughs> right? So the Lord's brother James, remember, he had a few things to say. And one of the things he said is, here's, 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 here's what'll work. If you were to confess your sins, you could be healed. So how many of you would like healing from some of those things that just rack your soul? You know what I mean? Guilt, shame, pain, heartache. Do you understand what I'm talking about? How many of you could right now just make a list of the things that have wounded you over the course of your life? Things you did to yourself, things that other people did to you. And the narrative that that's created about who you are, your identity. And what if the Spirit said to you, here's what will work. This is what will work. What would work is if you'd confess your sins, you will be healed. How many of you think it would be good if the world knew that? Like if the world knew the truth from God. How many of you think James is a pretty good book? That's a good one. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in James, right? Wouldn't it be nice to have a Bible study from the book of James? So, you know, you're kind of fumbling through the book of James, and you finally get to chapter 5, and you're motoring along, and people have really been into it, and your, your unbelieving friends have been kind of thinking, man, that's pretty good stuff here. Boy, I'll tell you, I didn't know that was in there. I mean, I've been telling all my friends at work and everything that you got to be quick to hear, Right? slow to speak and slow to anger, and it's really made a difference in my cubicles at work. And In fact, you know, I told people, man, you know, we treat that new guy kind of bad because we notice that the sole of his shoe is kind of coming apart because, you know, that's how we treat people. It kind of looks shabby. And we read that chapter two, and we just decided, man, we got to quit doing that to people. 
right? So they're thinking, this is pretty good. We got that chapter 3, and some of you need to shut up because when you open your mouth, you light things on fire. And we, we thought, oh, that was good stuff. And then we got to chapter 4, and it says, why do you argue all the time? It's because you want stuff, and you got the wrong reason for wanting it. And boy, we all know what that's about. And we couldn't wait to get to chapter 5. And we got there, and we read that if you go ahead and confess your sins, you could actually feel better, live better, be better. But we've been in this Bible study with you for the last four weeks, and we've never heard you do that. So we were kind of wondering about that. Do you like being sick, or you just don't believe God? And you're like, listen, I'm the one teaching this Bible study. <laughs> right? You know why I did that exercise with you? Because sometimes we have to talk openly about the reality of what it means to be a revealer. You see, what did John say? Number one John. Number one draft pick John. A-list John. Valedictorian John. What did John say? I don't know. Did I hear you right? Give me a couple verses, I'll say it again. I didn't know him. How'd you miss him, John? Well, you know what no eye has seen and no, no ear has heard, what no mind has conceived? Let me tell you, I have never ever looked at another man and thought, hmm, there's the Lamb of God. And I certainly would not have looked at this guy and said that. But God spoke to me. Dallas Willard gives a really important definition of spirit. He said, haven't you wanted to know what spirit is? Spirit is unbodily, personal power. Spirit is unbodily, so it's not restricted to a body. It's personal power, meaning what? It's interacting, it's moving, it's creating, it's generating. Paradigmatically, that's what God is. John 4, 24, God is spirit, right? So the theology, spirit theology, and I learned this from a Pentecostal theologian I'll tell you about in a minute, is that you experience God and you live the entirety of your life out of two questions. Who's the God I met and what does this God want from my life? If I were you, I would not miss getting that slide. If I were you, if I just woke up and thought, oh man, I slept and now Don's up speaking. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't miss that slide. And now I'm going to tell you why. Back in 2015, a friend of mine, Rodney Dillon, from the Dallas area, said, would you come and preach at our church in Dallas on Love First? And I said, I would. I didn't have the book written yet. None of that was happening. We were just learning Love First at home. Would you come and preach on that? So we set it up a year in advance to go to Rodney Dolan's church in Dallas, Texas to speak at multiple campuses. We were going to speak at his church. Then a friend of mine in Croatia, Tom Sibley, that I've known almost my whole life, because I'm from Portland, Oregon, called me and said, would you come and do a preaching seminar from the Biblical Institute in Zagreb, Croatia? And I said, we would love to. That would be wonderful. But at the same time, uh, my son, who was a missionary in Yekaterinburg, Russia, said, would you come to Yekaterinburg and do a seminar for these people that are working with orphan mentoring communities? And that was my son, so I said, yes, right? So it looks like that's going to be a pretty handy situation, right? But the first thing that happened was 
the accreditation in Croatia fell through and they weren't going to accredit the preaching course. And I thought it wasn't fair to these students to pay for an accredited course when we knew the government wasn't going to accredit it, right? So that fell off. But we still had Dallas and we still had Russia. But then something happened. Croatia came back online. So this is going to be exciting, except the problem was this. Croatia was going to start the night, we're going to have to fly out the night I finished in Dallas. And the only time we could go to Russia was the following week. And then Mark Love called. How many of you know Mark? Right? Mark is it? Is it? Um, Lives in Detroit area and serves at Rochester College. He's an amazing guy. Many of you know his parents. Well, I've also known them almost my whole life. Mark calls and says, Don, I need you to come to Rochester College for our streaming conference. And I need you to do a keynote on our streaming conference on racial healing. I looked at the thing online and I said, we already have Jerry Taylor. He said, Jerry has to leave, and Jerry said he wanted you to fill in for him. Now, there's one guy I would almost never say no to in the history of my life, and that's Jerry Taylor. But then I start telling the story. Well, you don't understand, Mark, you see, because I'm going to be preaching in Dallas, and then I'm going to be on my way to Croatia, and then we're going to Russia, and we can't fit it all in. Mark says to me, how long have we known each other? At the time, I said, I don't know, 45 years. He said, have I ever asked you for anything? Are you, who does that? I couldn't believe it. Well, here's what you need to know. He wanted me to come up there and speak the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday before I flew to Dallas to speak on Sunday in Dallas before I flew out that night to Croatia. You get the feel? So I go to my wife. I say, what do you think? Well, let's pray about it see what God thinks. There you have that. So we prayed. We felt, all right, we're going to do it. So here's how we did it. We packed everything for every trip. I took a little duffel bag on my way to Michigan and then to Dallas. Susan met me at the airport as I flew from Dallas back into Atlanta. I didn't even go home. She meets me there with the luggage. And we fly out to Croatia. And here's what happened. Amos Young was the keynote at Rochester. The world's foremost Pentecostal theologian. He got up and he said, my guess is there are not a lot of Pentecostals in the audience. (laughs) He didn't even risk a show of hands, (laughs) a show of hand. Right? But here's what happened. He got up and he taught us this. He said, this is how Pentecostals do theology. We meet God. And then we spend the rest of our life living two questions. Who is the God we met? And what does he want from my life? I have not been able to stop thinking about what he taught us that night since that night. Saturday morning, I go to the airport, fly out of Michigan, or Detroit, fly to Dallas. I can't get it off my mind. I preach in Dallas, preach on love first. I fly back, I get to Atlanta, Susan meets me there. We get on a plane, we fly to Croatia. We get to Croatia. We hugs and hugs and hugs people I've known my whole life. On the way from the airport to his house, Tom Sibley tells me, hey, by the way, all the preaching classes have been accredited, and here's what you need to know. Instead of 26 students, we have 40 because 14 students from the Pentecostal church have joined us for this course at the last minute.
Huh. Well, that's a thing. You see, there's no chance I would have been able to know how to interact and relate in that critical setting had God not worked. We go the whole week, we have a great time, we get on a plane, we fly to Yekaterinburg, but we had to, we flew all night, right? We get all night, we get in, go through Moscow, get into Yekaterinburg, get up the next morning, go out to this retreat center, and no sleep, and we are there all day. We're doing seminars all day. We get to the end, we get in cars. Susan and I get in a car with three people we've never met. One of them speaks English, the other two are Russian only. We're driving along, Susan and I are in the back seat of this car, Susan's to my left, uh, this other girl is to my right. I sit in the middle because I, I have terrible motion sickness, so I got to see out the front. Any of you have motion sickness? I mean, I can't even watch a toilet flush, right? And so <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting there, you know, and I'm trying to make sure I can see out. And this girl starts talking to the guy in front of her in Russian. And he turns around and says, she has some questions. Okay. So she asks a question. He says, she wants to know how long you've been a Christian. And at the time, it was about 35 years. I came to Christ in college when I was a junior. And a tear came to her eye. Wow. She said, I've never met anyone, a Christian, so long. And then she said, do you read the Bible? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, I want to. And then in Russian, she said, but I know God. I already know God. I already know Him. I already know Him. I haven't read the Bible yet, but I know Him. Well, you see, God had prepared me to meet someone who had met God and was now going to spend the rest of her life pursuing two questions Who did I meet? Who is this God that I met? So when I find out that he's Father, Son, and Spirit, I'm so glad to know that about the one I met. Right? And when I find out that his compassion extends to a thousand generations, that will heal my soul. When I find out that from the very beginning he had me in mind, he had his son in mind, he had our reunion in mind, he had the spirit in mind, he had the church in mind. When I find out all of that, I'll be just so excited. And when I find out that he would call me to live and die for him and live again, I would absolutely do it because all I want to know is who did I meet and what does he want? Meanwhile, Saul was on a trip. He had plans, right? He's a good planner. You know, he went into town, went to the head office, got all his paperwork worked out, right? Logged his trip with the powers that be. Where are you headed? Up to Damascus. What do you be doing? Well, I'm going to go up there and try to find these people that belong to the way and I'll be carting them back here, so keep a few cells open, so on and so forth. He's still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. I wonder what his theology was at this point. What was his theology at this point? What did he think he knew? He thought he knew God. Maybe John the Baptist doesn't know what's going on, but Saul does. Well, he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found anyone that belonged there to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners in Jerusalem. So as he neared Damascus on his journey, huh, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul met God. And then he waded into two questions. What's the first question? Who is this God I've met? What's the second one? What do you want from my life? What's the first one? Who are you? And what did Saul say? What did Saul Paul say in Philippians chapter 3? Well, let me tell you what happened. 
Oh, I thought I had life figured out. And then I met Jesus. And it turned out that I had been elevating a dung heap. I didn't think I was doing that. But when I met Jesus, everything changed. All the measurements of life, the measurements of people, what I thought mattered and what I thought didn't matter, it just all went out the window when two questions invaded my life. Who are you, God? The God I met, who are you? I just want to know Christ. Isn't that what he says? And he says, I don't have it all figured out yet, but you couldn't pay me all the money in the world to stop pressing on. And he said, the first thing he told me was you need to go into town and someone else is going to tell you what to do for the rest of your life. (laughs) Isn't that what Jesus told Peter? You used to plot your own trip, but now somebody else is going to come and bind you and take you where you don't want to go. So what I want you to think about is this. This life we're living in the Spirit is rooted in a theology of experience. We meet God. And then we just spend the rest of our lives getting to know Him and learning what He wants. And here's the thing. You won't ever know Him all the way. You just keep pressing toward it because you can't stand the thought of knowing Him more. My wife and I have been married 35 years. So often I think to myself, one lifetime is not enough. That's what love will do to you, won't it? And see, if we think we know God, what does Paul say? Anyone that thinks he knows doesn't yet know as he ought to know. Isn't that what John says? Isn't this the theme? That if you think you know, you might be operating off of Sauline wisdom. But if you really want to know, let the Spirit introduce you to God. So we're going to close there for today. You know tomorrow, you know what we're going to do tomorrow. I gave that to you a little earlier. We're going to come in tomorrow. We'll do this one tomorrow. Um, our friends from uh, ACU Press are here. They're outside. And they asked me to make sure I told you that along with the book Love First, they now have a video series for Love First. They wanted me to show you that, so I'm doing that right now, all right? And I want you to know about that because here's something I'm convinced of. When we love him with all our heart, We'll pursue him with all our soul. (coughs) Amen. Amen. Let's close out with a prayer. And God, we thank you for meeting us in this place. Thank you. Help us to know that we experienced you today. That you're here. That you're not hard to find for those who seek you. You're not playing some silly cosmic game of hide and seek. You're so present. But now we say, Holy Spirit, reveal him. Reveal him. Show us the Lord. Help us to know him and be consumed by these questions. Who are you, Lord? And what would you have with my life? We give this prayer to you in Jesus' name. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.